So this session is titled Driving Growth, Maximizing Paid Social Revenue with Data-Driven Precision. And in this session, you will learn how to elevate your paid social media game to the next level. Uh, discover the importance of data readiness for targeting precision and the impact of short form video content like Instagram Reels uh, on engagement and conversions. Uncover methods to prioritize customer value through advanced scoring, focusing on repeat purchasers and intent driven audiences. Finally, you will hear about how to best utilize Meta's dynamic broad targeting capability. And I know that I am very excited to hear about this. And I want to introduce our speaker, Justin Garvin, who's the SVP of Media Strategy at Rise, a quad agency. So come on up, Justin. Awesome. Thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, where, like we said, we're gonna talk a lot about uh, how to get the most out of your social investments. Uh, that's both through uh, unlocking the value of your customer data, unlocking the value of offline conversion data, uh, and really balancing uh, having control over your strategy with all of the automation and AI that's going on in the industry today. A little bit about me, um, I am Justin. I lead media strategy uh, for an agency called Rise. Uh, we focus on making all media accountable to business outcomes by connecting people, passions, proximity, and performance. Uh, speaking a little bit about people and passions on the bottom uh, is a little bit about me personally. I'm fortunate enough to have two beautiful daughters. Uh, I was told by a wise person one time that sneaking in pictures of my kids into a presentation buys me some brownie points. So there are my two beautiful kids. Uh, aside from media, uh, love uh, sneakers, uh, lots and lots of uh, sneaker collections that I have, uh, Netflix, uh, as well as doing DIY projects around the house. So let's talk about what everyone here is talking about already, uh, which is AI. Um, obviously, AI has been a huge topic in the space for many years. Uh, I had the opportunity to walk around all the different kiosks uh, today throughout the day, uh, took note of every single kiosk that mentioned AI, probably was at least six out of every 10. Uh, so obviously, everyone is talking about this. Um, that said, I think it's, it's, we've made kind of an interesting transition uh, over the last couple of years where we've really kind of gone from how will, uh, how will AI impact what's going on in the media landscape specifically to more recently, how is AI already impacting what's going on in the media landscape, right? It's no longer about brands and marketers trying to understand how they eventually uh, can prepare to take on what's happening with AI, but now more, more so focused on how are brands already uh, taking on what's going on uh, in, the, uh, in the landscape. So uh, let's talk about how it's impacting media specifically. Um, to break this down as simply as possible, I, kind of, I like to think about it kind of in two, two main groups. Right, so there is predictive AI on the left. Predictive AI, been around for a long time, uh, typically is a method of kind of analyzing massive data sets, uh, allows for the predictability uh, of trends, patterns, decisions that need to be made. Uh, and a lot of the ad platforms have really leaned heavily uh, into creating uh, more automation using predictive AI methods like automated bidding, value-based bidding, automated campaign settings, uh, which we're gonna talk a little bit about. And on the right uh, would be generative AI, uh, right? So generative AI is kind of the newer, hotter topic in the space today. Uh, generative AI is all about uh, understanding kind of how to create uh, from scratch, typically by you know, text-based prompts through the form of either text-based automation, image-based automation, or potentially you know, what we're starting to see already is video-based uh, creation at scale. So how does this apply to social ad platforms in particular? Um, as I mentioned, right, predict, predictive AI, it's been around for a while. Uh, if, you've, if you have relationships with Meta, Snap, Google, et cetera, you've probably heard them pushing. Google pushes you know, Performance Max as their kind of automated campaign setting. Uh, Meta has Advantage Plus, Snap has automatic, automatic bidding. 
Um, there's different audience expansion automation placements that enable brands to take advantage of all of the different placements that these ad pl platforms have available. Um, and, uh, and then lastly, there's kind of campaign budget optimization, right? And these platforms uh, have tons and tons of data on audiences, how they consume media, what they're passionate about, et cetera. And these automated campaign settings and broad campaign settings allow them to use their massive amounts of data to dynamically allocate budget, creative, you know, et cetera, to the different audiences that you're trying to engage with. Then we have generative AI. Uh, and I think a lot of times uh, people, uh, brands, marketers, et cetera, think about generative AI through some of the like external third party AI platforms like ChatGPT or Dolly or Copilot as ways to create, uh, whether it's images or text at scale. Um, but a lot don't necessarily realize that these ad platforms like Meta uh, are actually building generative AI capabilities directly within that ad platform itself. Um, so we've seen Meta over the last you know, six to eight months start to roll out the ability for uh, brands to, in platform, add a specific text-based prompt, create different versions, dynamic versions of that text at scale to start generating different ad copy, different messaging for different types of audiences. So uh, all of you should have uh, cards uh, in front of you. Uh, we thought to make uh, today a little bit more engaging as well. Um, we wanted to uh, ask some trivia questions kind of throughout the conversation. Uh, hopefully you'll notice these are not meant to be hard, brain-busting trivia questions. Uh, but uh, we do, uh, we would love for everybody to um, take a couple minutes kind of throughout today, jot down the answer to these trivia questions. Uh, if you do that uh, and you come up to our kiosk, uh, which is just up above on the, uh, on the upper floor, uh, we're right across from the super cool uh, Viacast tap making station. So big landmark, easy to find us. Uh, you have a chance to, uh, to win a prize. Um, so we're, uh, we're, uh, anyone that submits these have a chance to win either a really cool Yeti cooler or a fire pit. Uh, so highly recommend, again, answering these as we go through and, uh, and coming to drop off your cards. So first question again, fairly easy, straightforward, especially if you were just paying attention in the last couple minutes. Uh, difference between predictive AI and generative AI. Great, uh, so let's talk a little bit about how brands can actually leverage uh, predictive AI and how we recommend kind of balancing uh, both the automation and scale that platforms enable with also the ability to still maintain control. Uh, so, so that is typically how, uh, how we recommend uh, structuring uh, and building campaign structures as well as bidding strategies. Uh, there's, inherent value of tapping into all of the data that these platforms have at their disposal. Um, however, we don't want to just turn over the keys to the kingdom and let those platforms do what they will uh, with kind of how they're allocating dollars across all of your different audiences, across the different goals and objectives you may have, et cetera. Uh, so we need to have a little bit more of a balanced approach where we leverage their data, uh, but we also have the ability to control what audiences we're actually messaging to, what creative they're seeing, how much money we're spending on all those different audience segments. And so on the right here is just an example um, that's still a fairly high level uh, approach um, to how we like to structure uh, account structures. Where at the top, you kind of have that overarching Advantage Plus or broad campaign that Meta, uh, that Meta allows us to, to tap into. That kind of acts as a catch-all uh, to make sure that we're reaching all the audiences that we could potentially reach, and we're still leveraging the data that Meta has on how our audiences behave and what their passions are. But then we also want to layer in more manual-based campaigns or more targeted-based campaigns like dynamic product ads, which are typically you know, site engagement-related campaigns. Um, those may be broken out by different product types or goals, whether we have top seller uh, campaigns that we want to have or seasonal-based products that may have different goals that we want to get in front of specific audiences. And then we'll have conversion-based campaigns. Conversion-based campaigns we recommend typically breaking out having, uh, through both remarketing-based as well as prospecting. Remarketing conversion campaigns uh, typically have audiences that are all tied to some form of first-party data. Um, it could be past purchasers, which would be heavily focused on kind of retention, loyalty, driving overall lifetime value. 
could also be site-based first-party data, uh, encouraging kind of that first purchase based off of page engagers or ad engagers, et cetera. Prospecting then kind of takes those high-value audiences that we leverage within remarketing campaigns and starts to build lookalikes based off of them so we can prospect with purpose and make sure we're being as targeted and efficient with our dollars as possible to acquire new customers. And then lastly, we kind of layer in consideration and awareness campaigns for more of those upper funnel uh, goals and KPIs that we want to, to budget against. Now, uh, we, we know from experience that this type of a structure works really well, balancing both kind of automation as well as having some form of granularity, as we've typically seen about a 66% increase in conversion rate against those legacy granular structures when we've layered in on top kind of that advantage plus broad targeting campaign as well. Um, so these, these two types of campaign structures should work in sync in parallel uh, and a lot of times when we start working with a brand or we start seeing uh, a brand's account structure we a lot of times see kind of one very broad campaign that's leveraging advantage plus as the single campaign that that brand is running uh, which shows that there's a, a lot of opportunity to still maintain control and ensure that we're showing the right ads to the right audiences and we're allocating dollars appropriately based off of the different goals that we may have for all of these different campaign objectives Great, so automation is good, balance is good, uh, but if I'm using Advantage Plus and my competitor is using Advantage Plus and everyone else in the space is using Advantage Plus and Meta has the same data available to me as to my competitors, et cetera, how do brands start to stand out and differentiate and get that automation to work harder for them? One way uh, that we recommend uh, having, uh, or, or uh, building upon the automation that, um, that these platforms enable is to take your customer data uh, and start to segment and score it and then prioritize it based off of the different goals and objectives that you may have. Uh, so this is just a sample of how a brand may think about segmenting their, their first party data, right? But there might be action-based audiences. So these are people that have taken some form of action on the website probably have a different type of a goal, right, as these are people that haven't yet converted, but we want to drive that first purchase, that first conversion point. There might be people that are in kind of that behavioral category, so we know that they prefer to shop in store, or they prefer to shop a specific brand, or they have specific uh, dietary restrictions. Uh, there's kind of category-based purchasers. We know that they only typically buy from category A or category B. As we all, we all understand, especially in the grocery space, as an example, there's a lot of cross-shopping that happens where you may buy certain categories of product or certain brands of product from different stores. And then there might be value-based uh, audiences. So value-based audiences are typically going to be created based off of things like I, I know who my high frequency shoppers are versus my high average order value shoppers versus my best loyalty customers. Uh, and again, the idea is that each of these different audiences should have a different goal, a uh, different objective, but also most likely a different creative experience. Uh, and so we take these kind of different audience segments, we layer them into that account structure, really starts to show the need and the opportunity to have a balanced approach between kind of both automation as well as the ability to control who's seeing what and how we're prioritizing budget and KPIs against them. Additionally, um, we also want to make the automation as intelligent as possible, right? So what's, what, what, what typically automation has to go off of is pixel-based data, right? So anything that happens either within the walled garden itself or on your website itself. Uh, and as we know, businesses don't always uh, and solely operate based off of a click within a specific walled garden or a conversion point or a purchase within a website. There are lots of other offline conversion data points that really drive a business and the business's outcomes. Things like in-store offline sales data, things like uh, lifetime value of a customer or product margin um, that's attached to a specific purchase. Uh, and so if we can take all of those offline conversion points and start to push them and feed them back into the media platforms, we can use that to make the automation 
much more intelligent. So instead of Meta using its broad targeting to find people that have purchased and treat those people the exact same, we can instead tell Meta to find people that look like and behave like my highest value customers or my people that buy offline instead of online. As again, those people may need different experiences and have different value to the business itself. Now, some, in the past, it was very, very difficult for brands to take all that data, organize it, structure it, and be able to pass it back into the platforms to do attribution so that the platforms actually know this person was served this impression, and that impression was tied to this online purchase and this offline purchase. Um, however, today, these platforms have been making it a lot more easy and more streamlined to make those integrations, those connections happen through things like conversion APIs or enhanced conversions. Uh, and all social platforms, search platforms, et cetera, are enabling uh, brands to feed that data back in as they want the data. And it also, from a brand standpoint, is going to make your spend a lot more optimized. It's going to be tied to your actual business value as opposed to just kind of an online or a raw media KPI. So uh, if we're able to do this, right, first party data is going to, going to help enable um, better ways uh, for platforms to optimize towards your data instead of their data. Um, it's going to help us to understand what's actually working um, as we're going to be optimizing and getting vi better visibility into what's driving the business as opposed to what's driving just a raw KPI. Uh, and it's going to create a better ability for us to create new audiences that are all tied to this offline conversion data, whether it's we want to drive remarketing spend towards in-store purchasers or we want to create lookalikes based off of in-store purchasers. It's going to allow a whole bunch of new capabilities to create better, more informed audiences. So trivia question number two uh, is how can brands maintain uh, personalization with their audiences in a world that's moving more towards automation, having a campaign structure that uses a mix of automation and control, leaning into first party data segmentation, implementing conversion APIs, that's what CAPI is, uh, to leverage stronger data, or all of the above. Awesome, so how can brands start leveraging generative AI uh, for creative, right? So creative still matters. It's also still one of the things that is controlled uh, by brands. Um, these are stats that we've seen kind of across uh, a sample of our clients, uh, where we've seen about 15% higher click-through rate for video-based creative versus static images. We've seen about a 4x higher conversion rate when ads are personalized to each audience uh, versus generic. Uh, we've seen about a 20% decrease in cost per result when more than one creative variation was running for a given audience. Uh, so who, what, how much all matters. Uh, but same time, like we need, we need to have an approach and a framework to align what creative we're going to be producing for what audience and at what stages of their journey. Uh, so again, this is just a sample, sample framework where we like to kind of map out what that journey looks like, what are all the different connection points that we need to engage with our customer, how do we target those audiences, and then what's the best ad unit that we should be displaying kind of with, with that experience. So you'll notice you know, something like static ads really uh, is best for kind of bottom of funnel, where something like video really exists you know, and plays really well across the entire journey. Uh, and the reason for that is video and motion don't just drive engagement. We've also seen them drive commerce. Right? So there's lots of different technology providers in the space that are creating the ability for brands to turn their video assets into shoppable experiences. Um, one example is through a partner called Curve. Uh, Curve basically scans your website, understands what products you have, what's being shown in your video, and then automatically creates dynamic product overlays within your video content, within TikTok, within Instagram, that basically turn that traditional video ad into a shoppable experience where all those products directly click out and link back to your website for audiences and customers to complete their purchase. Then how can brands leverage generative AI? As I kind of mentioned already, right? Generative AI continues to evolve. Um, we've seen in the last eight months, Meta in particular, move a lot of capabilities of dynamic generative AI directly within the ad platform. Uh, in the last eight months, you've been able to upload a product image. 
You've been able to then take that image and use AI to edit it, to change the color, to add a background, to add a frame, um, to enhance it, lots of different variations based off of that upload. In the next couple of months, um, Meta just announced at their Performance Marketing Summit uh, a couple weeks ago or last week um, that they're also now going to be rolling out the ability to do full generative AI, where you're using a text-based prompt to create an image, both products as well as lifestyle image, dynamically um, without having to upload something. Uh, so this space continues to evolve. Um, we're going to continue to see Meta, Snap, as well as other social platforms bring that capability directly in platform. And so with that, I wanted to leave you with three kind of main takeaways um, in terms of how you can get the most out of your social uh, experience and social, uh, social budget. First is take a balanced approach between automation and control. Second is start to identify who your high value audiences are by segmenting, scoring them, and prioritizing them based off of your goals and objectives. And then third is Start uh, organizing and th synthesizing all of your offline conversion data to feed that back into the platforms to really make the automation work harder for you uh, and optimize towards business outcomes as opposed to, uh, to raw media data. And then a fourth bonus one is start testing generative AI. A lot of people, again, don't know that that capability exists directly within the platform already. Um, so start playing around with it. Uh, no brand, from my experience, has ever said, I have too much creative. I don't know what to do with it. So generative AI is going to help a lot of brands create more content at scale, be much more personalized uh, for your audiences. So with that, uh, this QR code on the screen uh, leads to some content that goes more in depth on uh, our kind of viewpoint on automation uh, versus control. Uh, please, again, stop by our kiosk upstairs, uh, drop off your cards for a chance to win some awesome prizes, and have some great conversations uh, and any follow-up questions that you may have. Thank you so much.